What's up? It's not a bird, it's not a plane, it's superhero slate. It's a modern podcast where we talk about everything that's great. Like movies, TV, superheroes. It's superhero slate. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Superhero Slate, the show where we run down the latest superhero entertainment news. We love TV, movies, and superheroes, so let's talk it all out. My name is Chris Dillard. And my name is Mike Royer. And this is our review episode for Ant-Man and the Wasp. Mike, we're here. The summer has peaked, if you will. Yeah, and not just peaked. You, I think you said it pretty uh, pointly the other day. This is the last Marvel movie of the year, which is weird. We're only halfway through the year. That's right. You can't hold anything back now <laughs> when it's the last one of the year. That's, yeah, that's, I, that's I, the rules. I feel like I'm expecting like a Doctor Strange in November or like a random Thor movie. I feel like those are the last two I remember kind of coming out at the latter half of the year. So well, we're, not- this, we're like officially in the dry spell until uh, March. nearly a year away. We got like 11 months to go, right? Well, March. March. We have we have Captain Marvel in March, and then oh Avengers yeah, that's right. Is, so so it's like, not too bad then. Yeah, normally we're we're expecting the November to be that Captain Marvel slot, but now we're in for Captain Marvel in March, and then. Almost immediately, bam! Infinity War Part Two, or whatever it's going to be called, uh, right after. But but we're not here to talk, worry about the future, Mike. We're here to worry about the here and now with Ant Man and the Wasp. Yeah, but I have a feeling the future might pop up when we start talking about uh, spoilers. But well, uh, we're going to go ahead and give you a, a filtered review off the top without any spoilers, and then a couple minutes in here, I think we'll start talking about the whole big shebang. That's true. That's true. So, Mike. What did you think of Batman and the Wasp? Ooh, it's your turn to go first. <laughs> I wasn't prepared, but um, so this movie is. I went into it with uh, the lens of seeing it as like a comedy movie because that's one of the few things I heard about the film before going into it. Because usually we do a pretty good job trying to avoid all of the rumors, the quick takes, and like the um, first impressions. So I was like, all right, this is a comedy movie. The first one was funny. I love Paul Rudd. So I got into that aspect, and I, I think that's probably the best um, uh, the best tactic for going into it because um, I feel like this movie gets caught up a lot on a technical mumbo-jumbo to the point where mm-hmm. you might have a character in there saying, um, uh, almost commenting on it, kind of like, huh? like how Han Solo might comment on the Force in a Star Wars movie. It's so, quantum uh, something. It's yeah. always quantum something. Yeah, so I, I thought that was almost a little detrimental at times. I know like uh, quantum mechanics and science is, is a very difficult thing to grasp, especially trying to tell an audience. And I'm not pretending like I understand it at all. I don't. But I felt like they were just kind of like throwing stuff up in the air and like just hopefully people just ignored it. Um uh, but overall, it was a it was a fun movie. Uh, I love the the set pieces. Uh, that's kind of what you go to these movies for. You want to see how they get big. You want to see how they get small and how they play with that. But I, I I wasn't really thrilled with a lot of the stuff in the middle. You know, they pepper in some good jokes here and there. Uh, there's, there's there's literally one part in this movie that had me like almost like bent over crying laughing because it was so funny. But then they'll be talking about the, these uh, this random reason that they have to like track something down, and I was like, oh, I don't know what's going on. I, sometimes I felt like I was in a really bad episode of like like a CW superhero show, uh, like the Flash or Arrow, when they just have to do like some techno mumbo jumbo to get something working so they can find the metahuman in the middle of the city. We're gonna ping it off satellites and do these things with this quantum gyro thing, and we're gonna find it. And it's like, okay, whatever, you're just doing sciencey stuff. Um, but once we kind of got to the fun parts, I was having a good time. Uh, Paul Rudd, of course, is hilarious. He does some fun performances where he kind of gets to act like some other people in this movie, which I was really enjoying. Um, but it, it, it was just definitely smaller scale, I guess, pun included. Even though it's not a pun because the scale gets bigger, so I don't even know if you can use that word anymore since he goes since he's technically giant man's out of the bag. Um, but I, I don't think I could. I don't think I would put this in my top three. It didn't blow me out of the water, but uh, I am glad we we do kind of circle back around slightly to the events that we see in Infinity War. So it, it, you kind of get right back into the thick of it almost. Like you're having a fun light time and then uh, it's right back to the, the tragedies that are happening in the MCU. So um, overall, I think the first Ant-Man is a little bit more effective for me. Um, 
but yeah, Chris, what do you what do you, what did you think about the movie? I I think I'm gonna swing the other way. I think uh, having watched the original Ant Man the day before going into this one, mm-hmm. uh, I find myself on my phone quite a bit while that one's going on, and uh-huh. this one. It's hard not to find a moment where there's not a smile on my face in this movie. I think it's fun. Like you, we mentioned fun and enjoyable, and this movie is thoroughly fun and enjoyable. Now, we just came out of Infinity War, which does leave you feeling drained and worn out, and you're like, oh my god, what have I, what, what has just happened to all these characters? Well, Ant-Man and the Wasp picks up um, two years after Civil War, uh, that way you, you find out what Scott's been up to since he showed up in Civil War two years ago. So this one takes mm. place concurrently, like in our current time, kind of. And um, what I, I really enjoy about it, I mean, I didn't get too caught up on the Momo Jumbo, but like the tech stuff, but it is a, it's, it's not serious, it's not heavy, it's a light kind of, almost like a heist movie, if you will, throughout the whole thing, um, trying to outsmart other other people all going for the same thing and and at the end of the day there are more angles at this movie than i thought there would be just kind of watching the trailers i thought there would be kind of a good guy versus bad guy kind of scenario and they they kind of threw some some twist in there which was um enjoyable i mean to not be again not be able to predict the movie going in um Overall, I think I like it better than the second one because this one is funnier more throughout. You're not learning about Scott trying to figure out what's going on with the suit. How does it? How is he going to be a good guy? Is he going to shrink or whatever? Uh, and then you know we do get to see you know them play with some scale and some scopes and stuff. And a lot of people are more comfortable with it. And I think that makes it um, a more enjoyable time to see those things happen. And, and definitely one of the standouts is other than you know. Uh, uh, I want to say Scott Lang is Paul Rudd being just hilarious to so everything. He was just on the point with all of his references and jokes. Uh, Evangeline Lilly as the Wasp, I, I really enjoyed her turn in this as well, uh, more so than the first one being the business partner who's got to get in to make sure the shrinking stuff doesn't get out. I I, I don't know. Uh, I think yeah, I do. I, think- I do. I was gonna say I do have a question for you. I think maybe I'll bring it up when we get into uh, spoilers, but. Um, I have a question. Since you did watch the first Ant-Man movie before you walked into this one, um, I'm curious uh, about what you thought about the relation, relationship between Scott and um, – what's her name in the movie? Hope. What's the actual character's name? Hope. That's right. They said Hope. it like a thousand times. I don't know. So I'll bring that up here in a little bit. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, I think at the end of the day, the, um, the, the stakes are not nearly as high in this movie, Mike. I think you'll agree with that. Um, yeah. Mm. Uh, the world is not at stake. Lives are really not overly – at stake, even though they could have been several times, um, it, it's it's not it's not as heavy, and and that I think is, is beneficial to itself. Uh, it does, I think, you know, the big MacGuffin, or what I thought would be the big MacGuffin here, and, and we'll talk about this later, is the return of um, uh, Janet Van Dyne, and I think that's maybe one of the weakest points of it for me. Um, is that it, it her. When, when she shows up, and, and you know, I won't, I won't spoil anything, but, like, it's just not nearly as um, effective as the rest of the movie uh, when, it, when, it, when it all comes together, I guess. Uh, but, I mean, so I guess it's a good and a bad thing. The movie is very simple, but that's good because I didn't need an overly complicated Ant-Man movie. And that's also bad because it there is a lot going on here, and they just kind of gloss over it for everybody so the pace keeps moving. Like yeah, I, I don't I don't know if I would use the word sophisticated when describing this movie. And I don't know if really it needed to be. Um, but I, I think if it... I, I don't think this movie would be made if it wasn't funny. But if the movie wasn't funny, I think it would definitely knock it down a few pegs for sure. So, mm. um, But would you recommend it, Chris? Before oh, we I, I definitely spoilers? would. I mean, I think, I think this is something you got to see on the big screen um, because you're going to see little things and big things and size changes uh, whoops, uh, all over the place. And I think this movie is something you need to see in theater. Um, I would, you know, say watching the first Ant-Man Civil War, then this is okay. I just watched the first Ant-Man. Uh, if you've seen Civil War, you kind of know what goes on. But, I mean, there, there's a little bit of homework in this. But I think I'd recommend it wholeheartedly, Mike. Would you? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think at this point in time, like, how many movies are we in now? How many of these have they made? It's been going on for 10 years. 19 We have to, like, 18, 19 now. Yeah. It's hard not to recommend any of the Marvel movies. Uh, off the mic, we were just talking about, like, kind of the Rotten Tomato ratings for these. I think it's still easy to recommend almost any Marvel movie just for the sake of being part of a whole giant universe. But it sounds like we're really bumping up into spoilers that we want to talk about here. Yeah. So, Chris, I think it's time to raise the veil. All right, so... Um I, we're, here we are. We're in spoiler territory now. Just as a warning, and I would I would almost title my review for this, Mike, if I had the chance that um, Ant Man the Wasp reveals very little about the MCU, and <laughs> very little is in quotes because uh, it does go very very small in this movie in, in terms of quantum realm. But uh, yeah. what's the question you had before I forget? I don't oh, want well, you I was, forget the question here. Well, I was going to ask since it's been a while since I've seen the first Ant Man and the Wasp. I I or the first Ant Man. I I I know that Hope and Scott kind of romantically kind of butted up a little bit in that first movie but since it had been so long since we've seen that kind of relationship come back together I, it wasn't super believable for me in this movie uh when they were kind of they had like a brief moment in like a janitor's closet at the school which was the funniest part of the whole movie in my opinion was him walking around like a little mm-hmm. kid in that hoodie i was dying so i'm really glad that uh, <laughs> that was in the movie um, and then later in the movie, it wasn't really a, a big romantic thread. It wasn't like a driving force in the movie. I mean, Scott would have saved Hope no matter what because he's a hero and they're friends. It doesn't really matter if they're romantically involved. But did that seem a little bit more organic to you since you saw the first Ant-Man first? Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, it ends with them coming together finally in the first movie. But I think the best parts of this are... You know, it is there that, that tension's still there. She's mad. They're mad because Scott went off to do the Civil War thing without mm-hmm. them, and then um, they're they're back, and he's still kind of worried about himself. Um, and I I just think um, the uh, Hank Pym's interactions, like when you stop staring at my daughter for like five seconds so we can get this done, kind of thing, was the the right kind of I don't know. It broke up the tension a little bit without making it overly. Oh, googly eyes for the wasp and the Ant Man kind of thing to me. It, I mean, it didn't feel bad. No, it, to me, that's yeah, what well, you're looking for. Well, speaking of uh, Michael Douglas and Michelle Pfeiffer, uh, Marvel and Disney have uh, <laughs> almost perfectly executed this software and engineering to de age people. I mean, man, am I looking fo- forward to uh, Miss Marvel now? Captain, uh, Captain Marvel, Marvel please. She's, she's, to see. she's military <laughs> rank now. <laughs> really? Because I want to see what they do with uh, Coulson and with, um, with Samuel I mean, L. Jackson. Been, you've been reading the show notes, haven't you? <laughs> yeah. If well, you guys people... want to know more about Captain Marvel's de-aging, you tune into our regular show after Yeah, this. make sure you're subscribed. So, uh, yeah, they just really nailed it. I felt like maybe at the very beginning of... Was it the first Ant-Man movie where we saw Michael Douglas yeah, de-aged? Yeah, he was de-aged, and he uh, he was dealing with Peggy Carter and um, the other Howard Stark. After. Yeah, they've really they've really knocked it out of the park. And man, Michelle Pfeiffer looked exactly like she did back in the day. Like, and as soon as you see that, you, uh, and you're an audience member, and you know what's going on, you're instantly looking for that line. You're trying to see where the CG is, how they're trying to blend it, what are they doing? And I was like, I don't see anything off the bat here. But you know, I'm a little less perceptive to this. I don't know if that's if that's a good thing to have. Uh, or not when going to these movies because General Tarkin didn't really bother me in uh, Rogue One, uh, so maybe I just can. Maybe I'm just a little bit more immersed in the movie than most people are. But man, they are they are just killing it there, which is really really mm. good for a cinematic universe because there's going to be lots of point in times where you're going to want to jump back and jump forward and stitch things together. And now we don't have to worry about kind of awkward shots of just the back of the head where you never see their face, you know? Or, or I mean, even then, like, you can cast any actor at any age and de-age them if you need to be for certain scenes. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, right now, like, right now we have the Tony Stark. There are two actors who play uh, and Howard Stark, actually. Um, the the future version, who was in Iron Man 2 and, and Ant-Man, and then, uh, you know, the other one who's in, of course, Captain Marvel, or not Captain, Captain America, and uh, Peggy Carter, so... Um, yeah, I, I think that I think the digital digital de aging was, was awesome. But yeah, speaking- we're like we're like what maybe twenty or thirty years away, or even less, of just like a phone app just being able to do that live on the fly. Uh, I mean, there's already like filters that can make you look old, so I'm sure there's going to be ones that just going to make you look young like that. Oh, 20 weeks, man, not twenty years. I mean, sh- <laughs> come on, Snapchat needs to find something new every every week to keep people entertained. Um, but speaking of that, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer, I think. Uh, I was really excited to see what she did with this movie, and I think her kind of Deus Machina role at the end was—it um, was just too simple. 
I guess. Yeah, I, th- I think it went into the realm of problematic. I mean, I think we do... I think we do a good job of uh, keeping every movie that we review honest, whether it's an MCU movie or not. But I felt like that was the biggest kind of uh, stumble in this whole movie uh, was, first of all, I thought it was kind of weird that um, Michelle Pfeiffer was all over the marketing for this movie. That, and so we knew she was going to be coming back. But well, I assumed we'd be I'm, seeing her in the first act or the second act. I'm, but I'm going to disagree Sinner, with that because she's not in a single trailer. But she was on all of the posters and stuff like that, so it's not like they were trying to keep it a secret. Well, like three posters. Uh, she's I have I actually have one of the posters. Like she's not on a couple of the first ones. So well, I don't either think, way, I don't think they, she's well, all over the marketing. But I do. I mean, I'm going to agree with you saying bringing her up at the end was just like this is way too easy for for this movie. Yeah, I mean, she basically was the whole crux of the movie. She was the mission, the ma- the ma- uh, the MacGuffin of the movie. Yeah, and, and when she when she came back, I thought her weird ability that she gained to kind mm-hmm. of fix Ghost, I was just kind of like, "What's going on here? This doesn't make any sense." She just has some sort of really weird, unexplained power that they're not going to explain to the audience. They're just gonna they're just gonna hope that we just trust that someone going into a really random realm. We'll just give you powers that you can control. Um, there's a weird moment where she's in kind of like um, like rags and a cloak, and it felt like that um, that one Halo trailer from E3 a few years ago where Master Chief is in full mm. armor, but then he's also like wearing like a, a rag. And she's like, why is he wearing that? And I was looking at her, and I was like, where did she get that? Where she's in this like really random realm. So I don't know if there's going to be a third Ant Man movie where we get some explanation of first of all how she survived all that time well, where is she finding random rags it's just kind well, of like they do I, they do all of this kind of really broad explanation but then when things shows up that i actually want to know i don't get any explanation at all well again I, it is the end it has to wrap up nicely in a neat bow before obviously um going to to shit uh, really quickly in the the post credit scene um so i will forgive them a little bit for that because i mean She's been down there 30 years. I think that's my biggest... How do you survive 30 years in this realm um, of this? I mean, I'm sure time flows differently down there. She talks about time vortexes. Uh, she knows these valleys. All this other stuff going on. So something's going on down there. And I think even though we get the Ant-Man and the Wasp will return... Question mark at the end, Mike. I do <laughs> think that, I do think a third... I mean, if they can greenlight a second one for this movie, I think they can definitely greenlight a third one uh, for this. Because I, I love kind of some of the stuff they're going to be introducing us to and i think playing into avengers 4 i think i think we're going to see avengers 4 lean into this quantum realm the time vortexes uh some other stuff and and we'll talk about that here in a minute but i I think yeah it just it's too nice of a little bow on the end like she comes back she fixes uh probably the biggest threat with just touching her head and then they're like okay we got to get more energy for her to fix her later so um it was all a very nice little bow that came up out of the quantum realm and, and i would i would say biggest component. they were they were trying to put a bow on it but i would say it's a very messy bow uh you know if if they were just gonna give michelle pfeiffer this kind of magical ability quantum ability to fix ghost why if they weren't gonna explain it to us why didn't it just fix ghost like all the way like why did they like it seemed like they're like well let's make it fix her but not fix her all the way so we can explain what's happening in this post credit scene which is kind of weird. It's just like, oh, well, we now we got some more quantum particles for your ghost friend. It's just like, well, I thought she just fixed her. What happened to all that? And then um, Lawrence Fishburne, is that who who's yeah. in this movie? Yeah. yeah. He, he makes it a point to say like, oh, uh, uh, she's very smart. Let's just wait and get her back and maybe she can fix you. It's like, well, her smarts didn't really fix her. It was her magic voodoo powers. I think it would have just been better if they finally rescued her. And then when she came out, she was just like, oh, I learned so much while I was down there. Because, you know, she channeled into Paul Rudd and used some sort of, like, uh, super knowledge to, like, find her. So I was like, I could easily see her just coming back, hopping on a computer, typing in some code and fixing Ghost very easily. So, yeah, it, uh, yeah, the, the bow is very messy at the end, well, I mean, in my opinion. I, I don't think so because the story wraps up and is done. Like, all the, all the threats are taken care of when I say it's a nice bow. I don't care that they didn't explain it. I don't care that they have to do more. I don't care that they have to do a third movie because I want to see a third movie with this. Um, but that is the the ending, the last, I guess, one of... It is the final act, but some of the final acts are really fun. I like seeing, um, you know, Scott take the truck a lot farther as, like, a kneeboard than I thought he would across <laughs> San Francisco. Uh, yeah, that was a good part. Um, I like that. 
what I, I really think is interesting here is we have all these movies where people have powers and suits. Iron Man, uh, Thor, um, you know, people who have these abilities and those abilities are taken away from them. And how do they deal with that? Because this very much felt like Iron Man 3's, like, proto suit issues he kept having with the uh, gold suit. Um, mm-hmm. Where it would, like, it would malfunction. Like, it would work sometimes and sometimes it would just blow up in his face kind of thing. And I, I saw a lot of parallel with that in this. Like, the whole time Scott had a suit, it was, like, not working very well at all for him. So, um, which led to some of, like you said, your favorite scene. You're, like, you think you're the most hilarious scene. But I think I really enjoyed him in the water um, chasing chasing Sonny Birch off the thing because the ants kept getting eaten from the birds. Oh, yeah. fell into the water. And he's like, I'm just going to take this and... He, he brought the thing back. Um, but, uh, but I think speaking of uh, Sonny Birch, I, I just kind of want to talk about the villains in general. Um, I don't. I think Marvel kind of falls back into its uh, old rut of kind of underperforming villains because uh, I had like no fear intention on the screen when I was either seeing Ghost or the uh, the fancy Southerner or whatever uh, mm-hmm. Scott was calling them. Uh, ghost powers were very, um, I would say. Um, uh, uninspiring. She could just kind of like phase through things, and I never really saw the danger in what that was. At one point, her her hand had like phased through um, Hank Pym, right? But we never, but we never really saw her at any other point in the movie like use that to like brutally murder anybody. So it just seemed like she had the ability to phase through walls, and she was just kind of hard to catch. And that was about it. So I was never really intimidated by her when she was on the screen. Like when she would pop up out of nowhere, there was a good chance it could be funny. Like when we had that that classic My- Michael Pena scene where he was doing his true serum. That true was pretty serum. funny. Yeah. I was really digging that. And I liked it when she just kind of popped up because it freaked everybody out. But like at no point in time was I ever intimidated or scared. I was just kind of like, man, I just wish they could just like grab a hold of her because she's just being really annoying. So um, it, it would be nice if maybe in a third Ant-Man movie we could have a little bit more – Maybe impending doom, something that they were maybe a little bit more worried about. Um, so I was a little disappointed See, by the villain. I'm gonna go the, again, this is what I said. To me. I don't think the stakes need to be high because we just had a world-ending death catastrophe movie. Well, yeah, I'm not saying Ghost needs to necessarily want to destroy the world. I think I think her basically trying to kill the mother is, is our, our stakes are just fine. But like the villain and just like the power set, like they're just. I don't know. She never really seemed like a threat. It's like as long as you just don't let her touch you, uh, and even if she did, we didn't even really see what she would have done. So yeah, there's nothing well, really uh, scary there. But but that was also explained like you know Bill Foster would not help her if she killed anybody. Like that was like she used to be a mercenary like spy person who would kill. Um, and they, he was like, no, if you kill anybody, I will not help fix you, and you will die. So I mean that was a, a little balance to that. Um, I thought they were gonna be. I thought she was gonna be his daughter. I guess at um, when they yeah, revealed them, but they didn't yeah, that's really that. confusing because since she was um, since she's mixed, so mm-hmm. she you know so her parents are of different races. When they started showing that flashback and they were showing like that bald white scientist, and I'm like, wait. That's her dad. I'm getting really confused, especially since we met Lawrence Fishburne first. I don't know if maybe there was like a quick shot of like a photo on a mantle somewhere that I missed where it showed her two parents. But I was, yeah, I was really confused in that whole cut scene. I was like, what is going on here? Yeah. Um, what, I think one thing that also doesn't, it doesn't bother me. I just don't get it is um, Scott's daughter, Cassie, and then like her mom and, and her husband, they're all like one big happy family regardless. And I was like, that's, I don't know, I mean, I'm sure there are divorced families or, you know, split parents who don't, you know, who, who act like that. But I was like, they're a little too lovey on Scott, I guess, at the end of all this. Maybe because he saved the world in Civil, I don't, well, saved fought Iron Man in Civil War. I, I don't know, what do you think about that one? Yeah, I, that's the thing. I was kind of hoping um, I would get a little bit more clarity, but uh, maybe this is just, I guess it wasn't helpful for you since you watched the first Ant-Man movie ahead of time. Yeah, that was the big drama point in the first movie, right? Uh, because there was a, a new man in her life, and he happened to be a cop. So I don't really know what was going on there. Well, uh, he wasn't—he wasn't, he wasn't he, new in the—he's not new man in the movie. He's been around a while in the first Ant Man. It's just oh, he was. Yeah, yeah. Like they—they—they they, they all knew who he was. But like this time, like they were like, "Hey, you know, get a job. Like your work. If you get a job, you're fine. But you know, until then, you're kind of on 
watch. And then in this <laughs> yeah. one, they're like, oh, God, lo- Scott, we love you. Feel better soon. Don't be I guess safe. that's the moral of the story, right? If you uh, if you want to get people to like you, just become a superhero and uh, try to save the world. But even then, he didn't really save the world, did he? When he, he went to he just, Germany, he, he was just kind of yeah. yeah, he was just helping out Cap. You know, really, it could be very polarized. You could have a lot of people out there that really like Iron Man. I'm sure there's yeah. Iron Man fanboys in the MCU that hate Ant Man because they're like, hey, he's there messing with Iron Man's crap. Yeah, uh, so <laughs> yeah everyone's got a side. Everyone's got a side in there. Um, also, I lo- one of my favorite running gags, Mike, is the close-up magic tricks. <laughs> close-up magic. Close-up magic. How do you do that? Everyone's like, how do you do that? And then they had the, um, what was it, his parole officer or whatever? Like, they kept, they, that was kept a, a repeating thing, like, oh, it's got out there, and then he's got to get back before everything, every, every time. He's always a race back to his house to put on his ankle bracelet. Um, I, who, who was that actor who played the parole officer? I think, is he, is he an off-the-boat he uh, he he's in a uh, fresh off the boat. Uh, like he he's hilarious. He um his name's Randall Park, yeah. And he has this uh, funny like little web series out there that he did a while ago. I think it's called IKEA Heights, where they filmed an entire uh, web series inside of like an operational open IKEA. They just did it kind of gorilla style, and it's really funny. So I'd recommend go watching that. But yeah, I was digging Randall Park, the parole officer. It would it would have been uh, great if. Uh, Maybe uh, uh, Mr. Park and Mr. Rudd could be in a comedy movie together just on their own, just without superpowers. I think that'd be hilarious. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd love to see him return when they inevitably announce a third movie for this. Well, yeah, they got to get dinner, man. They got to get dinner. Good Lord. <laughs> um, overall, what about the action scenes? I, I was thoroughly impressed with the uh, more, I guess, not advanced, but the better choreographed action scenes in this one. Um, what, what, how did you feel about them? Yeah, I think uh, I think the two of them pairing up together is really fun. I like how they retrofitted all of those different cars with uh, shrinking and growing levers. So that's kind of what I expect out of an Ant Man movie now going forward. Is I just want I just want them to be playing with scale the entire time, which is uh, what we got a lot more in this movie, which was great. Um, I felt like I saw a lot of the kind of cooler action scenes, unfortunately, in the trailer which this might be the first time maybe one of the Marvel trailers revealed a little too much after seeing the movie. Like that whole kitchen fight scene with like the salt shaker and the knives and the tomato and like the and like the the flattening mallet. Mm. Like we saw all that in the trailer. So when it was on the screen, I was like, "Oh, I kind of I kind of seen this already, unfortunately." Um, so that was kind of a bummer. Uh, and then since Ghost didn't do a whole lot action-wise, I mean, I'm not trying to rail on ghost i don't think it was like a cardinal sin but you know when she was on screen i don't think there was a lot of fun dynamics with her powers like when when um when scott is doing the uh art of distraction like the first rule in close-up magic online school university or whatever he said he was just trying to distract her in that third act while they're while they snuck away with the lab right so all he's doing is just running around in this kind of abandoned loft while Ghost is just walking through things. Like, that's literally all she did. She walked through a table. Next scene, she walked through a wall. Next scene, she walked through a partial wall window. So when it came to action scenes with her, I didn't really care that much. But when they were trying to escape the Southern gentleman in, like, a car chase, that was a little bit more exciting, I thought, because, you know, they would have to do these cool things with the car and scales, and Scott would hop on that flatbed truck, and he had to, like, (laughs) fling the little gun out of the guy's fingers. And then when he was chasing him on foot, he was like re- kind of reaching through that alleyway and he couldn't quite get to him and he kept growing. That's when I thought it was fun. But you'd think it would be the other way, right? You thought you would think the action scenes would be a little bit more high high stakes and fun and energetic with a superpowered villain, you know, but it, uh, unfortunately it didn't go that way. But well, I'm, think, I'm glad at least we got the scale stuff to play with no matter what. So there's, there's two things to add to this one. I think um, the second Matrix movie, despite it being, you know, a pretty terrible follow-up to The Matrix... They had the ghost twins in that movie, uh, mm-hmm. and I think they did a much better job ghosting than Ghost did, because uh, mm-hmm. they phased through stuff. That was their whole job. They had a car chase scene where they phased through stuff. But I also understand she couldn't control her powers a lot, it seems, sometimes, Um but, yeah, that's really what Ghost does. It just phases through things. Yeah. I mean, it seemed like she had really good motivations in the movie. Yeah. Um, like, I-, I couldn't quite get the story straight because I think right after she did her villain monologue, um, Hank uh, Hank Pym said, like, oh, she's lying. It was totally the other way. Different things happened. So I was like, I don't really know whose side to be on. But I was like, if I was a little kid 
and then my parents like lab blew up and it was your fault and then it just basically made me slowly die and phase in and out and I'm in pain all the time yeah I think yeah I think you're probably in the right here I, I, I could see maybe why you might want to like kill uh, his wife to feel, to heal yourself. So I didn't really have a whole lot of sympathy for Hank Pym in this movie. I was like, you're kind of being a dick, and it looks like you created this whole problem to begin with, dude. Well, he I mean, he he didn't blow up their lab. He didn't mess it up. Like they blew well, up their own. Then lab. who did? But, well, but that was the that was it, her whole motivation. That's why she hated. He, he did Hank. it off grid, like and did it himself and blew himself up. He didn't like so, Hank was not involved in making that when he. This is like Iron Man 2 all over again, where they kicked off Vanko's father, so he decided to make his own little, um, you know, I guess, uh, arc reactor. Yeah, uh, I think the story here is you don't take villain notes from Iron Man 2. <laughs> yeah, well, like, well, um, that's what I'm trying to say. Like, Hank Pym had nothing to do with this blowing up at all. This other guy went and made his own quantum tunneling device, and then it blew up because he didn't make it right. Um, and gave her the powers. Well, I mean, but I, I mean, I agree with you. Like, her, her motives were, were okay. Like, it's like it's like either she can die or and, or we can bring her back and maybe she can fix me. Like I can live and she can die and she's been gone thirty years. So what's the point? Versus, so I mean I get that. But the other thing is we're very we're taught very much in the first movie. If you use the Ant Man suit without the helmets, you go crazy, right? Mm-hmm. How do they continue to shrink people down? In cars, like at the drive-in movie theater thing, and like, how do they keep them? Like, they were just shrinking things left and right with little blasters. How do they make them <laughs> not go crazy without having the suits on, the containment suits? I don't know. I guess maybe they're just gonna like uh, glaze over that fact so they I don't can think, just. Have... I don't think anyone else is pointing this out but me. Like, maybe yeah. I'm missing something, but I'm like, well, they were very, very adamant in the first one. Like, Darren Cross went crazy because he was in the not using around those particles too long, and it was messing. Yeah, up his I don't. Head. Maybe it was something to do with... There's one thing that I couldn't quite pick up on. So they lose the lab in like the first act, and then they have to go find it. So they go find Lawrence Fishburne, and he says something, uh, quantum quantum mumbo-jumbo, there's a regulator... There's a regulator or something, and if you and if you tweak it, maybe you can find the lab. I it made no sense to me. That's kind of where it really felt a lot like I was watching an episode of The Flash, and Cisco was trying to do some mumbo jumbo. But then he was Scott was just like, oh well, I have an old suit, maybe, and it's on the old suit. So I don't know, maybe the new suits can do that. But that doesn't even answer your question of uh, of like Michael Pena getting shrunk inside of the car. But he did. But all of the shrinking of the other humans was inside of a car though right um, so maybe maybe they theoretically could maybe they're retrofitted cars or something maybe there's like some sort of oxygen flowing through those other that i mean that would be a way to explain it like i have a i have a feel like if you tweeted at peyton reed and demanded an explanation maybe he could find a roundabout way of saying oh they all shrank inside cars so it's just all in the cars i don't know <laughs> yeah well i mean i don't i don't need an explanation it doesn't ruin my experience of it but I, that just crossed my mind well, when i walked out i'm like yeah everyone, i think that's everyone kind everyone of is now just shrinking willy-nilly at at whenever they want to like, yeah so no i think that's the greater theme of this movie is they are they are lucky because they can get away with a lot of these uh, kind of slip ups because it's it's a funny comedy movie. I would say this movie is angled more at being funny than Thor Ragnarok was. Yeah, uh, and you know, and that was a little bit more of a sophisticated story. I would say so. This one, they're lucky that the jokes were hilarious. Paul Rudd is just a joy to watch on screen. And uh, Michael Pena is a, a, a great to bounce off uh, he, of. And he got to do one of his stories, or two of yeah. his stories, and they were like, oh, you put a dime into him, you got to listen to the whole song. <laughs> yeah. Like, That's awesome. So they were lucky that they were filing all, on all cylinders, because if all of that stuff was mediocre, I I think this movie would be, you know, like I said, falling down a couple more pegs. But I, I, I think I, I want to talk about this post credit scene, and not the one that we saw in the trailer, which kind of rubbed me the wrong way. I waited for all these credits to see a shot that I saw in the trailer. Oh, then you really, can get the, over that shit. That, that really that, doesn't matter. No, that bummed me out. No, we we we're doing a podcast talking about the nitty gritty stuff. I'm gonna talk about that nitty gritty stuff well, that annoys me. Well, I think but, I, before we get to the last scene, which which might tie is, is the Scott playing um, Michelle Pfeiffer's character, like she's voicing through Scott, was <laughs> on par the whole time. I was yeah. That, that's a great distillation like, of also what I just Paul, said. Where it was, Paul Rudd just nailed everything he was doing, and it was oh yeah, so the worth mannerisms it. was was great. Yeah. Um, that's the perfect distillation of like that scene was hilarious and funny, 
But if you really think about it, that's just a lot of like another just weird mumbo jumbo scene. Like, oh, quantum entanglement means that she can jump inside of your head that's from all the quantum to, realm to, to do stuff. It else. just it doesn't make any sense. It, I mean, it's we're, easy. In a, we're in a movie where people shrink to microverse levels. It doesn't need to make sense. Qua- quantum entanglement. They can she can give him a map and talk through him through an as an antenna. Great, fine. Scott no, Lab I think, played the part perfectly. As Michelle Pfeiffer's Janet. Oh, I'll agree Bingo. that he he definitely nailed that's Michelle Pfeiffer and that the scene. mannerisms. I think that's great. But I will I, I I'm not gonna I won't forgive this kind of stuff uh, going forward. So hopefully I'm just hoping it all stays in this Ant Man movie and none of it bleeds over into my Avengers movie. None of it because, ever bleeds in any other movie. Though. Well, like, that's, it, that's the it, thing. They're all it self-contained. might because if we talk about if we're talking about the post credit scene, um, uh, Janet Van Dyne made a point to say. Don't get caught in that. What she did she call it a time realm? No, or it's a time, a time skip vortex. You don't even remember it. I, don't, I can't even trust you at this point for talking. About okay, this okay. Sorry, I didn't remember the second word after the word time. <laughs> it's time. All it, I was, all I was focusing on was time. So I think this is probably where the whole like time travel theory of the next Avengers movie is going to be built into all this quantum realm stuff. I don't know if Scott is going to escape through this time entanglement, whatever the hell you just called it, vortex. Uh, but I, I just hope that, you know, well, if he does show up in the Avengers movie, he's not going to be able to explain any of this quantum stuff. So I think that's going to be OK. I just don't need another scientist on screen going quantum, quantum, mumbo, jumbo. Mumbo. There's nothing I can say that, that'll make this uh, make any sense. So um, but I, I thought well, that was a cool scene overall. I had a feeling it was going to come. I was hoping that's what was going to happen. And then he's just trapped there. They all turn the dust. And then it was just kind of like. I thought it was a kind of a funny moment of just like, hey, guess what, audience? You just had a really fun two hours, you know, just laughing at all this silly stuff. You got to see Paul Rudd act like a woman. Wasn't that funny? Oh, wait, everyone's dead now. So I thought that was really funny, only, just the juxtaposition of the two themes. Only half the people are dead. Um, and just so happened ha- three out of four of these people died while Scott is in the realm. Uh when we don't know we don't know how he gets out that's that's a definitely a big question mark at the end of this like is he going to use these time vortexes is there i mean i guess um the hulk is still alive right and iron man is still out there and i think that's all our scientists left is that, <laughs> is that right like that's all yeah. we know so and i the, think so and then even i mean even um doctor strange is gone he worked with the time stone so um, yeah, we don't know how he's gonna get out of this microverse, um, but uh, they uh, yeah, it'd be hard to even find that equipment on the top of the parking garage. But like, yeah, push this button and we'll get Ant Man back. You know, you know what I'm saying? Um, mm-hmm. I don't know how they're gonna do it, but you, you, I mean, you, it was very poignant that they said time vortex. Like I agree with you. Like they did say this is the word time blank. So now let's. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because because that line, yeah, that line could have easily have been anything else. So you know, we talked about you know the the set shots from Avengers Four uh, like a week or two ago. We had this whole segment where we talked about all the like the little bits that we saw. But yeah, maybe that's where this comes from. It makes sense. You know, you don't have a sorcerer really around. You don't have the uh, Eye of Agamotto anymore to play with time. You know, that's stuck on the Infinity Gauntlet. You got to get that from Thanos, and I don't think that's going to be easy because uh, he can just, like, power Jimmy in the face, even if you can manage to find him on whatever planet he's on. If so, his arm's not all torn up. Yeah, so who knows? Maybe, uh, maybe Bruce Banner is going to sit down in front of a computer and be like, I'm reading these weird quantum signatures, so maybe I can pull something out. I don't know. But uh, it, it seems he, like Ant-Man's going to be really important, or at least his world is going to be really important in the next Avengers movie. Yeah, I think I think that's... that's if, if this is does go forward like this, they'll probably have to... Whenever he goes... Whether he comes back or forward in time, who knows where he'll land at if he does this. Um, maybe... In, I mean... Maybe he's back in the Avengers battle because some of those set photos were during the Avengers battle with Ant Man. And he has that same suit on too yeah. in those Avengers Four set photo, which was something I brought up between these movies. The heroes always get a costume refresh. You know, it just it's just a thing that they do for the films. And his suit looks exactly the same as like he's been trapped somewhere and then he just shows up. So yeah, so, yeah I'm really curious how this all hooks together. Yeah, I mean, that would be, it would totally throw things for a loop if he got thrown into the Avengers um, movie as Ant-Man. Um, 
but he also does not know anything about Thanos or why people disappeared on him. So oh. um, I wonder if he's going to try to take that information with him or something like I don't know. There's a lot of questions there for that one. And then um, the last in credit scene that Mike is so thoroughly upset <laughs> about uh, is is the ant playing the drum kit uh, from from the trailer. Uh, we saw Scott play it, you know, a couple times throughout the the movie, and then the ants just playing it. But I like the the. I mean, although half the people are gone, this felt like everybody was gone in this city, and um, I, I like that the, is... the was it the the emergency broadcast signal? And like, yeah, the and there was silence like maybe a was really siren. really weird. Yeah, that's the that's the one little bonus. I'll obviously you you can't you know really put that subtlety in the trailer you know just the ant part was in the trailer but i did like that because that's what i've been craving since the end of uh, avengers infinity war you know we knew we know agents of shield isn't going to come back until after this is all wrapped up in the summer next year uh captain marvel is set in the 90s so that's not going to deal with the ramifications you know we've just been craving just anything we can get of what happens after that finger snap so it was kind of interesting to see that the world is not going to go on like normal there is going to be just crazy just there's going to be gaps in every other place that you look and there's going to be warning signs sirens people are freaking out i would love to see like a marvel i would love to see like the marvel one shots come back or something and then when uh ant-man comes out on blu-ray maybe we get a one shot of what it's like to live in this world you know just Mm. like you know five just give me like five crafted minutes of filmmaking of just what it's like to live in this like post snap world it doesn't even have to be any heroes in it it could just be like maybe a agents of a a retired agent of shield that just like living in florida or something i don't know um (laughs) if you have to tie it into the mcu somehow but uh yeah so i thought that was cool i like the spookiness of it kind of bringing it back around to the stakes that are really waiting out there for ant-man i feel like ant-man is really uh gonna be at the grasp of the uh at the mercy of the reality stone like if thanos is turning people in the rimids if ant-man is a giant man he's just gonna snap the reality thing and i don't know turn him into like bubble gum and it's not gonna matter if he's giant or something i don't know I, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know if he'd even want to fight Thanos. Um, but I mean, it was, it'll be interesting to see his powers come into play in the second one, and how like will the Avengers be like, hey, you have this ability, let's use it. Like, mm. um, so I don't know what's gonna happen. Uh, we've got, a, I mean, the movie doesn't leave a whole lot of questions like that, but it definitely sets us up, reminding us again, like you said, Infinity War is out there. We are now in a world where half the people are gone, and we have to deal with. Essentially, the Avengers losing uh, is what Captain said, uh, and um, we're gonna have to see how that plays out. I'm yeah, not- this kind of feel it feels like a boutique Marvel movie. It's just like it doesn't really live in the greater threat of the MCU. It's just kind of this side, just fun movie, just doing a lot of weird stuff. You know, there there's some issues here and there, and I look forward to going uh the months forward arguing with you constantly about the the quantum science of this movie because it's just going to be fun because i love how juxtaposed we are on the matter that just makes the podcast more fun for me i like it when we're not agreeing on stuff uh but before i think we sign off uh it seems like we both want to recommend this movie but uh real quick i think this was literally one of my favorite stanley cameos because i love it when he gets like really crazy like the i love the strip i love the strip club cameo and uh that was the first deadpool right yeah yeah so i love this one even more he's just like oh i had a lot of fun in the 60s but it's all <laughs> catching up to me now i, I just like uh I, I like him when he's like more rambunctious like that so the great stanley cameo exactly i've, I've got to say I, I want this will be our opening here and people who have opened or listened to the show up until this point, we'll, we'll get this reference. But I gotta say, what up? <laughs> Don't you remember that old classic reference? <laughs> yeah, what was up? No, okay. So I, I just, I just, I, I don't know. Michael Pena was just on point. I'm glad they gave him a little more to do in this one. So uh, it was, it was pretty, it was pretty entertaining. So uh, yeah, I, I'd recommend it. I think if you watch the first one, the first one's utilitarian. It's like we have to introduce you to Ant Man. We have to just introduce you to shrinking and, and the size changing stuff so we can use it in Civil War. And then this is the next step in it. But I think the movie tells a better story. So if you watch them back to back, you'd be like, oh yeah, Ant-Man 2 or Ant-Man and the Wasp is way better because of all the characters involved. So um, yeah. I think everybody everybody has their own ranking system when it comes to movies. They might even employ a different system when it comes to Marvel movies because they're so episodic in general. But uh, this movie, I would probably put it in my back half of all the MCU movies, but that's still 
mean, that's still pretty good. I mean, even the even the worst MCU movie is is still more entertaining than um, some of the other superhero flicks out there. I won't name names, but uh, Fantastic Four. It's awful. Don't even touch it. <laughs> don't even touch it with a ten foot pole. But I mean, if you if you're if you're out here in uh, Southern California, it's like crazy, super hot this weekend. Got to like 115 degrees. So maybe an air conditioned movie theater will be your friend. So you might as well go see this movie. Uh, there's no reason not to. Did you? We didn't even talk about our movie going experience. I have to tell you. I think I texted you this. The theater, the opening IMAX that I was in, had the smelliest people I've ever <laughs> smelled in my life in that theater. Oh no! Like just body odor all over the theater. Like they were not well kept people. I'm like, is this the summer movie going crowd normally? Like, <laughs> um, and it was the first IMAX showing. I mean, we had reserved seats, and I was. It was just, man, I didn't have any food issues. Once the movie started, I was fine. But, like, getting there, I was like, oh, man, I'm always worried. I'm always yeah, worried man. about this. It's the stresses of going to the movies. We had a pretty good experience, but my wife did lean over to me and said, did you hear that kid? And I was like, what are you talking about? This was right at the end of the movie when you see the credits pop up on screen, Ant-Man and the Wasp. She's like, the little, the, there was a kid behind us that just saw the title screen and said, who's the Wasp? <laughs> and it was just like, I don't okay, okay, kid. <laughs> This movie is a little too highbrow for you, I guess. Yeah. But uh, he gets yeah. quantum entanglement, but he does not know who the wasp is. Oh my god! I, I just... No one gets quantum entanglement, Chris. Not even you. Yeah, I, I totally get it. I'm to- I'm totally entangled quantumly. It's no. I've seen Quantum Leap. I know what that is. <laughs> I know what that is. All right, Mike. Well, we got to do a regular news show. So if people want to know what you're up to, where can they find you at? Well, if people want to yell at me, they can find me at Mike Royer Design on Instagram and Twitter, and I'm sure somebody's gonna <laughs> gonna be throwing shade at me because I'm frustrated about science. But uh, Chris, if people want to follow you, where can they find you? Well, if you want to tell me how right I am and how wrong Mike is, you can find me on Twitter at Valdan V A L D A N or Instagram Valdan eighty seven. I can have a comic UI as well. Uh, if people want to listen to our new show where we're going to talk about some digital de aging. Uh, where can people find that at? Well, as always, please visit SuperheroSlate.com. We do a weekly news show every week. Uh, This is actually bonus episodes that you're listening to now is when we get a chance to go to the movies. So every week we do a news episode, and you can find that on SuperheroSlate.com. And you can get us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, TuneIn, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. You can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and you can get merch for Superhero Slate at SuperheroSlate.com slash store. If you're a fan of what you're listening to, we'd love to get a review from you. All you got to do is head on over to a place like iTunes or Stitcher or any place that has reviews and drop us as many stars or hearts or thumbs up as you would like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions. Drop us a review, and we'll be here every week. And we love you super fans out there. If you want to be a super fan, just share the show with a friend, share the show with a buddy, and stay tuned. Comic-Con San Diego is coming up in just a few weeks. That's going to be a huge episode. Oh, my God. It is around the corner. We have so much news. So much, so many quantum announcements coming out of Comic-Con. Oh, God, Chris. All no, right. All right. I'm, right. Done. I'm we'll, done with you. All right. We'll see you guys later. <laughs> Thanks for listening, and don't forget to subscribe. I got the new slimmer, sexier can, which I thought was funny.